is San Onofre. And blue, in the year before that, San Onofre was number one in the country for safety complaints to the NRC. And you have to understand the significance of this. They're complaining to the NRC because they're too scared to complain to their management. Because, look at the next chart. This is worker complaints of retaliation or harassment for raising safety concerns. They're number one. NRC two years ago had to issue a chilling effects letter to Edison, saying that they had created an atmosphere of intimidation at the plant so that workers were too scared to bring forward safety complaints. And by the way, in the last few weeks, Edison has announced it's going to fi fire eliminate the jobs of one-third of its workforce. So if they're having trouble operating safely with the current workforce, imagine how well they'll do with something like uh, 700 fewer, five, six, seven hundred fewer workers. And also figure out who's going to get fired first. The person who raised the safety complaints is the person you want to keep. Or the person who kept his or her mouth shut when they saw safety complaints. So, let me end with a couple of other little factoids about San Onofre that make me nervous about it in general. Um, I mentioned the backup systems and what happened to Fukushima. You need off-site power to run the pumps to keep the coolant moving to prevent melting of the fuel. And so you need off-site power lines. And if you lose those, you need backup diesel generators. Most of us who live in the San Lorenzo Valley, we lose power several times during the winter. We have a little backup generator to provide power. If we didn't, it wouldn't matter that much. We could get through a few days. But if you don't have power for a few days in a nuclear reactor, not only are you in trouble, but eight and a half million people near you might be in trouble. Oh my God. So they have backup diesel generators. Great. But for four years, the operators of San Onofre had not properly connected the batteries to the backup diesel generators. They didn't catch it for four years. Eventually that got caught, and then a year or two later, they were trying to start up one of their backup diesels, and it wouldn't start. It's OK, you have a second one. But that one was down for repairs, so they didn't have one. They had to scram the reactor. But my most favorite story is that for five years, Hourly fire watches. What? It's supposed to every hour go out and check to make sure there's not a part of the reactor burning. The reactor comes <coughs> Every hour you're supposed to do that. For five years, the hourly fire watches weren't done. The log documenting the fire watches was fabricated, not for a day or a week or a month, but for five years. Oh without the operators, the management, the superiors, supposedly catching it. And the only reason there were supposed to be fire watches in the first place was because in the 1970s, there had been a terrible fire at the Browns Ferry reactor, um, and they had almost lost control of the reactor. Um, and so the NRC ordered all reactors in the country to replace wiring that could catch fire and to put in barriers so you didn't have one set of uh, wires close to another without some kind of a barrier or distance. Edison resisted. And three decades later, they still haven't done it. What they told the NRC, and the NRC said, fine, is we'd like to have a, a waiver or an extension for another year or two. But don't worry, we'll put in place compensatory measures, a lovely phrase, which simply means we'll put in place um, fire watches which for five years they didn't do. A fire can knock out your controls so you can't cool the fuel. A uh, earthquake, a fire, um, other event, terrorist event can take down your off-site power. If your backup diesels don't work, you have what we saw at Fukushima. Uh, in addition, San Onofre is very close to a complex of earthquake faults that the Coastal Commission and the Energy Commission say appear capable of larger and more frequent earthquakes than the reactor was designed for. Fukushima 
was designed for an earthquake vastly less large than what destroyed it. The same thing can occur in Southern California. So you have the perfect storm. A reactor next to an earthquake fault complex larger than the reactor was designed to withstand. And you all remember, uh, many of you have heard me before, that I love this definition. David Brower's definition of a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor is a complex technological device for locating earthquake faults in California. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere you build one, you find a, a, a fault. So you have a large earthquake fault complex next to it, large, more capable than the reactor is designed to withstand. You have the second largest population surrounding any nuclear reactor in the country, second only to Indian Point outside New York City. So the consequences of something going wrong are immense. Eight and a half million people within 50 miles. You remember that the NRC recommended evacuating Americans 50 miles from Fukushima, but the evacuation zone in the United States from the same agency as 10 miles. Oh. And it doesn't matter, how would you evacuate Southern California anyway? You, you can't move without it, even without a, a, a meltdown occurring. The freeways are always jammed anyway. So you have an earthquake complex, you have a very high population nearby. You have a management structure that is broken, a safety culture that is sick that retaliates rather than rewards complaints, that suppresses things, that lies about important safety matters and tries to cut corners. And then add on top of that, you have very crippled steam generators that have broken in a year or two when they should be capable of operating for decades. And a company that wants to start them up without fixing them. Uh, and quite literally hope for the best. And even that's not bad enough. They want to do that without a hearing and without a license amendment. And their decision to avoid a license amendment and to avoid a hearing is what got us into this mess in the first place. It's a billion dollar error just on the dollars. Forget the human lives. If they had gone through the license amendment process, if there had been a hearing, um, it is possible this issue would have been detected. NRC, <coughs> after the fact, reviewed the computer model from Mitsubishi and concluded that it was wrong, that it underestimated steam flows by a factor of 400%. Well, if NRC staff can review the computer model after the steam generators were put in, they could have reviewed it before before they cut holes in the containment structures, before they put these in it, before they ran them, and one of the tubes burst. So they seem not to learn from history. Friends of the Earth, Natural Resource Defense Council, have petitioned for a hearing, an evidentiary hearing. What would you do if you were NRC staff and Edison to show that you really were serious about looking at whether this was safe? We'd say, fine. What did NRC staff and Edison do? They each individually submitted pleadings that looked as though they had been written by the same entity or that the NRC staff was behaving as though they were co-counsel with the utility they were to regulate, and which they argued that there should be no hearing. You know why? Because NRDC and Friends of the Earth had not filed their request for a hearing electronically. Oh my God. You have to understand that the lawyers for Friends of the Earth had contacted NRC staff and asked for the access code to the electronic system so they could file electronically. NRC staff refused to give them the code Good. and God. then argues that they should not be permitted the hearing because they hadn't used the code that the <coughs> NRC staff would have given them. I mean, Kafka, <laughs> <laughs> there are job openings. Uh, at NRC, but I think they've been already filled with some of Kafka's siblings. <laughs> so it's, you laugh at it, but it's very serious because if they get the permission to restart, and there's nothing right now to stop it, Region 4 of NRC will take a few weeks to a few months to pretend to review this. They'll send two or three sets of questions, and then they will grant the request. They may attach 
one or two trivial conditions to make it look like they've done something. But that plant will restart. And it may be okay. I mean, it ran for 22 months and was getting some damage. Running for an additional five is an increment above that. And then another increment, and another increment. You know the old uh, story, you uh, uh, walk halfway to the wall, and halfway to the wall, and halfway, you never get there. They only look at the tiny increments of additional use. Not looking at, hey, can we run this thing long time, long term, with tubes that are wearing down so quickly? And it's already damaged goods. So the question is, what can be done to change that so there is a process that is honest? And the only answer I can give you in closing is that informed citizenry can make a difference. We've seen this many, many times before. Senator Boxer chairs the Oversight Committee for the NRC. Senator Feinstein chairs the Appropriations Subcommittee for NRC. And Jerry Brown has the power to say to the Public Utilities Commission and the Energy Commission, no. Uh, none of those things are happening quite yet. And that is because, in part, of the power of utilities, and part because there is not sufficient voice from the public to make the political figures listen. Um, you all remember that you know uh, politicians, even those who have substantial ethical cores, um, in some sense are also trying to figure out which way the wind blows, and that tells us that we must be a force that is showing where that wind is. Yes. In the absence of it, Senator Offer will start up. It'll run for five months, and maybe something will happen, and maybe won't. We'll shut down for a little bit, look at it. And there'll be very minimal, uh, not minimal, but marginal difference to run for five months compared to the previous 20. So there's not going to be much to see anyway. They'll start out for a longer period. And maybe they can limp along for a couple years that way. Or maybe a bunch of tubes start to burst, and those tubes bursting propagate, and those propagate, and we have a major problem. Or there's an earthquake that occurs at a time when you have weakened steam generator tubes. Remember, they're already very thin. Now they've been thinned for them. And that was uh, from 1997 to 2012. And he gave you the statistics on the 25 plants. So I thought, well, this is going to be pretty easy. You know, I'm used to doing research, and I'll just go and, and look these things up. And it really probably will, I don't know, maybe it'll take like a weekend, something like that. Well, like, I can't tell you how long it took because it's so hard to get the information from the NRC on their website. If y'all would like to go look at it, it's nrc.gov. And has anybody here ever gone to their website and looked for documents? It, it's really hard, isn't it? Yes, because you look at them and they talk about how transparent everything is and so forth. And then you get to actually try to find them. And it, it's just a very, um, it's a very difficult process. But if you ever want to, I don't know what, if you ever can't get to sleep one night or something like that, you might just try to do it. And really, literally, I used to almost... Sometimes I would just get in kind of this daze and I would start to fall asleep and I would think how boring it was to do this research. And then I would, I would kind of snap up and I go, oh my God, what am I talking about? This is about something that could have horrible impacts. If something were to happen, it could kill so many people. And it kind of made me think about that idea that there's so much banality in, I hesitate to use the word evil, but I think if anything um, in this world is evil, I would have to say, um, this kind of manipulation about nuclear energy um, and the misuse of it. Um, still, there were over a quarter of the plants that didn't even have any wear on their tubes whatsoever. And when I say that, I'm not trying to say that these plants are therefore safe. I'm just saying, as far as their tubes were concerned, there wasn't any wear. And then Dan mentioned how thin the tubes are, but he didn't say exactly how thin they are. And when I found out, I was really shocked because they are like some four hundredths of an inch thick. Oh, God. Yeah, and so, and then when you think the usual plugging level is like 40% through wall before you absolutely have to plug a tube. But that is one thing I was pleased to notice is that a lot of the, um, a lot of the nuclear power plant operators actually do plug the tubes earlier. And that's one thing I want you all to be careful about because Southern California Edison is saying that, oh, well, we didn't really have to plug all the tubes that we plug. Remember, they plug 510 in San Onofre 2, the plant they want to start again, and over 800 in San Onofre 3. And so they're trying to make it, they, um, 
their spokesman, Jennifer Manfrey, recently said that we only had to plug six. Only six were above this threshold level. And yet, so I thought, well, I'll go through all these reports and I'll see how many other had to be plugged because they're over threshold level. Well, out of all these other 25 plants that I looked at, there was only one tube in one plant that was over the threshold level. So, uh, waived in the air by Senator Boxer at a Nuclear Regulatory Commission, at a hearing with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, of her uh, Senate committee. She said, this is very important. I want each one of you commissioners to right now commit on the record that you will review it and that you will meet with my staff uh, to address its issues. I just want to hear, can we do that? Yeah. Uh, and then there was press coverage throughout the state of the report. So I want you to understand that if students can do this, if we can do this, we can end up having some impact. Here from Santa Cruz, a study was done that was then waved around in Washington mm -hmm. and is, uh, was covered by newspapers uh, throughout the state. So we can try to get the facts out and uh, facts sometimes have power. I want to introduce our last speaker um, and uh, try to put in con who will try to put in context what we've been talking about regarding Santa Norfolk. Um, nuclear power is a troubling technology um, in part because of the intermix between pure engineering, which is relatively uh, free of extraneous forces. Either the pressure will work or the pressure won't. It's, it's empirical. But there are oftentimes other factors that interfere with those engineering judgments. And our speaker, Dale Breidenbaugh, uh, spent his career as a nuclear engineer rising to be uh, a manager at General Electric's nuclear division. And he and two colleagues um, in 1976 became troubled about problems related to the boiling water reactors that GE was manufacturing, in particular the uh, Mark I containments. They became concerned that the modeling that was being done, does this sound familiar? wasn't taking into account real conditions, and that in a real accident, the BWR uh, Mark I containment could fail, causing massive release to the environment. They took that issue to their superiors, thinking perhaps that this is an engineering concern, a safety concern, our superiors will do the right thing. The superiors didn't do the right thing, wanted to suppress the information. And with great courage and a substantial human cost to himself and his wife, who's here as well, their family, uh, Dale and his two colleagues, their families, uh, chose to resign publicly, testify before Congress, and uh, uh, raise the issue publicly. They are, in some sense, like that, those red lines that we saw in those last two charts. People willing to raise a safety concern despite the risk of intimidation or retaliation or other effects. And the sadness about it all is that the alarm that Dale raised, um, I would like to say was wrong. That the Mark I was just fine as a containment and that they were just pushing a procedural issue that if they had done the analysis, analysis would have shown that the containment would withstand the problems. And the sadness is that Fukushima, which were <coughs> boiling water reactors, Mark I containments, GE design, I believe the first one was actually built by GE, um, those containments failed one after another after another because those small Mark I containments could not withstand the pressure from a real accident. Exactly as Dale had warned decades ago. And if that warning had been listened to, maybe what happened to Fukushima wouldn't have happened. 